Okay, welcome everyone to the first webinar in our new series, Getting Started with OER, and happy Open Education Week. I'm Leah DeForest, the Communication Strategist with Texas Digital Library. Now, before we get started, uh, I want to briefly orient you to the controls in BlueJeans that you should be able to see across the top of your screen. So starting from left to right, you can toggle off and on your webcam and your microphone by using those first two buttons showing the camera and mic icons. Your microphone should be muted when you come into the meeting. And again, we ask you keep your video off and your microphone muted as well. If you happen to have audio issues using your computer uh, audio, you can switch to phone by clicking on the little down arrow next to the microphone icon. You'll see a phone number to call in as well as a numeric code to enter. And if you have questions or comments during the presentation today, we invite you to use the chat window, which you'll see in the upper right corner of the screen. Just click on that to open up the chat and enter your question. And just so you know, we'll address questions to presenters during the Q&A part of the webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties during the presentation, you can let me know in chat. And in a minute here, I'm gonna put my email address in there so you can email me offline and we'll try to troubleshoot any issues. And now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers. So today we're kicking off our new webinar series, Getting Started with OER with lessons learned. And our guest speakers are going to cover a breadth of issues, their challenges, and how to sustain some of those early wins when getting started with OER. We're gonna to try to save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. And I'm really pleased to welcome all of our presenters. We're joined today by Philip Anaya from the Alamo Colleges District, Carrie Gitz from Austin Community College, Deanne Ivey from the University of Texas at San Antonio, Rusty Kimball from Texas A&M University, Colleen Lyon from the University of Texas at Austin, Ursula Pike from Austin Community College, and Kelly Viznak, Associate University Librarian at the University of Texas at Arlington. Now we're gonna get started with our first presenter, Rusty Kimball. Hello everyone. Bye. PowerPoint comes up. Uh, instead of a dedicated OER librarian uh, here at Texas A&M University Libraries, we have a program called OACES, which stands for Open Access for Student Educational Success. And it's basically a team of subject librarians led by a subject librarian, which is myself. And this layout that we have was originally envisioned by our scholarly communications director, Bruce Herbert. Um, and so basically we promote and facilitate the adoption of open access textbooks, open, open educational resources, and existing library license materials as alternatives to expensive commercial textbooks on the Texas A&M campus. So basically our program, we um, target us, uh, we're starting out targeting low hanging fruit, which means uh, the open access textbooks that are already uh, available that match up to uh, introductory courses. Um, we also have another program on the side uh, that's with the Student Government Association. And we've worked with them to uh, create uh, teaching awards that they nominate uh, instructors on campus who are using or are creating OER for their courses where they've abandoned a commercial textbook. Uh, our team consists of nine subject uh, librarians as well as our uh, scholarly communication director. And some of the advantages of having a team like this is uh, each of us are individual subject librarians. We already have established relationships with our departments. And so it really allows us when we do approach the departments and work with the individual courses that the librarian already knows the material and already knows the people involved. Um, hey, Russell. 
and also having enough people allows us to better focus our our efforts. Rusty, this is Leah. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, your slides aren't coming through. Can we take a second and see if your screen share is going to work? Oh, I thought you were conducting the slides. No, I'm sorry. I think that you are, but you know what? I can bring them up if you give me a second. One moment. Okay, Rusty, I'm going to share my screen. Sorry about that. I think I must have misunderstood. Are we still on the first slide there? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Okay, okay thanks. Or, uh, sorry, I misunderstood. Not at all. Um, and so you can see on this slide, uh, there's eight, uh, there's two librarians that aren't shown in this this picture, but you know, you can see the faces of the, the librarians actually on our team. Um, and so I was talking about the advantages of having a team. Um, and so we, we all as subject librarians have knowledge of the library resources that correspond to the particular discipline. And we also have uh, experience teaching in the departments as well. So having a team does enable me to delegate things that I don't have time for. So there's another advantage. Um, our program is not even two years old yet. We started in May of 2017. And so we haven't hit the two year mark yet, but we began by working with the College of, College of Geosciences and the Biology Department. And in the College of Geosciences, we've got a couple of course, custom course packs uh, in the works, one's already in use, and those consist of um, existing library license materials in combination with OERs. Um, but also with the Department of Biology, we had a, um, an adoption of the uh, OpenStax uh, textbook, and as a matter of fact, that adoption was the single largest adoption uh, so far for one of the OpenStax textbooks. And that was for Biology 111 and 112. Um, on the poster, you're seeing a picture of a lot of the teaching faculty uh, there on the right, composited in what the, uh, our certificate looked like and the, the cover of the biology textbook. And so also on that picture is the biology librarian, myself, and the dean of the libraries. So some of the challenges we ran into being a brand new program, we did have some startup money, but our stipend fund uh, quickly became exhausted. So it's sort of a, a cost of success. Um, we did prepare a proposal to the university up to the provost and president last year, and ultimately that proposal failed, but we're preparing a new, more streamlined version this year. So uh, the biology uh, adoption I just mentioned, I, I meant to include that the savings to students for those for the courses, biology and 111 and 112, is over $600,000 annually. Uh, this year, uh, we did manage to get some more funding. Um, so we decided to reduce the our amount of our stipends to $500. And we're really focusing this year, 2019, uh, on OA textbook adoptions in particular, as well as uh, library ebook replacements. Uh, I want to mention that we also have another potentially even bigger adoption in progress for Psychology 111. Um, the enrollment of that class is 7,000 students. And they use uh, a number of different textbooks that range in price from $100 to $256. We will be meeting with them uh, to discuss their choices 
and some of the details, uh, any uh, modifications they want to make, but they're looking at three different uh, psychology introductory textbooks on the open textbook library right now. And so we'll be discussing that in a few weeks. So the potential savings for these students, if they adopted this, uh, these textbooks would be over a million dollars a year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we've run into. Um, anytime that a, a instructor uh, adopts one of these textbooks, there is a matter of um, time to invest in changing uh, syllabi, et cetera. And so <clears throat> time is really worth more, um, worth more than money to them. Um, and so, as I mentioned, there is a lot of work to redesign a course around a new book. Uh, and also, the, our work as librarians, uh, it's, it's time consuming sometimes to help the instructors work these out, particularly for the uh, custom course packs that I mentioned earlier. Uh, another challenging has been funding. Uh, we're hoping to uh, get our new proposal in soon and get more funding from the, at the university level. And so it is really a challenge to the subject librarians like myself because we, this is all in addition to our regular duties. So time management is a real challenge. Uh, some disappointments we've had, uh, we had some faculty who originally expressed an interest in OER alternatives, but just didn't find it practical to switch due to their time constraints. Uh, we had one in the department that had just adopted a new commercial textbook, so they just couldn't swing uh, going through that process again that quickly. We even had a full professor who um, who just didn't find he had time to uh, devote to compiling all the different OERs for uh, his course. And finally, we had a professor who expressed interest and then realized that the current textbook he was using was one that was written by faculty in his own department. But these are just disappointments. Uh, but the enthusiasm that we receive from most of the departments we, we meet with is overwhelming, so it, it really overrides any um, disappointments we've had. Uh, as far as lessons learned, um, one thing I didn't really foresee is managing money, but uh, I've just found that just using common sense and uh, making good decisions has made that possible. Uh, we had a, a workflow worked out with our business department to transfer funds to the individual departments. Uh, I do find that uh, I'm having to balance this with my duties as a librarian, so it's sometimes challenging. Uh, one thing I'm really happy about is being able to get input. I don't have any managerial experience, but I find that this is a very easy product to sell. Um, uh, just, uh, just having good arguments, I don't necessarily have to be a great salesman to succeed. Um, I'm also happy that I'm able to get input from not only the SCALCOM director, and his experience with scholarly communications, but also from uh, another subject librarian who also happens to be my boss, who gives me plenty of uh, advice when I ask him. So it's been a challenging, but not an overwhelming project, but it's been quite a bit of fun. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Rusty. And again, sorry about that hiccup earlier. Uh, I think we got it figured out in the end. And just a reminder to everyone before we move on to our next speaker, we'll share links to all of these presentations and a recording of the webinar after um, it's been captioned and published on YouTube. Okay. Thanks again, Rusty. And next we have Deanne Ivey from the University of Texas at San Antonio. And Deanne, we don't have sound. There we go. There okay. you go. Should be working now. All right. I am Deanne Ivey. I am the OER coordinator, and I'm also the social sciences librarian at UT San Antonio. And um, I'll give you a little bit of background and uh, overall view of our program. Um, we started exploring OER at the end of 2015, and um, started talking with OpenStax and joined um, as a partner with OpenStax and 
We offered our first round of grants in 2016, and we offer those in the spring. I'm a little exhausted today. We just did our, uh, our workshop for faculty yesterday. We try to time that with our um, grant application uh, due date, which is this year, it's March 18th, so a couple of weeks out. We usually have a workshop where we have faculty talk about their experiences with using OER. Um, and uh, since 2016, we've awarded 47 grants. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of the scope of the program, we have quite a few of those that we've awarded. Um, and our applications are, they increased greatly, they tripled from the first year to the second year. So we had, the first year we had about 10 applications to the program, and the second year we had 30. So there's, there was definitely a lot of interest um, in that year. Um, the savings at UTSA since um, the inception of our grant program, six and a half million. Now part of this is projected. One of the things that we did work into um, kind of building sustainability with this is the very first year that we awarded grants, it was a pilot, one pilot semester to try an OER text. And um, what we did the second year is we worked in four semester adoption. So trying to build that in um, to help increase, uh, you know, the, the usage and the longevity of the usage, I guess, of the OER. Um, and so we have a return of investment of $72 for every, every dollar, dollar that we've invested into the grant program. So how is our grant program funded? Um, mostly from the library budget, um, but we have had some help from the office of the provost. When we had an interim provost, they were able to offer up some additional funding, um, which was really exciting. We've also worked with Student Government Association, and I actually have pulled up the crowdfunding project from last year, so I'll show you what that looked like and, and talk a little bit about that. And um, this very last year, end of 2018, the tail of 2018, our library development officer was able to secure um, a $5,000 donation from our president, um, which has been, has done wonders whenever we're promoting the grants this spring with uh, faculty recognizing that ad administration is paying attention to the work they're doing with OER. And um, I think it has elicited more comments and emails whenever we've, we've sent out proactive emails to our faculty, the librarians do. So very similar to what Rusty was describing the structure at A&M, we very much have that here. We have, I believe, 15 subject librarians. I'm also a subject librarian for the social sciences. So a lot of what Rusty was saying about struggling with time management, I am, I, I'm in the throes of that right now this spring um, because of all of the heavy OER work and then also our initial librarian work at the beginning of the semester is I have a, I have a heavy, heavy workload, so that's definitely a struggle. Um, but we've been able to make a lot of uh, a, a great strides in the amount of time that we've been, we've had our program, we've had adoptions uh, in biology, and uh, our math program has gotten involved heavily. Um, and so we're working on now, I'll show you, let's see, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges that we've encountered um, and the things that I see as challenges kind of heading into the spring, things that I need to tackle this year uh, that are big. Um, we are... We have our course filter implemented into the course search at UTSA where students um, can filter out for low cost textbooks. Um, but what we did is we kind of got ahead of ourselves a little bit with that. We have the filter implemented, which is great, but the structure behind it needs to be, um, it needs to be streamlined a bit because it's um, me basically handing off the classes that are adopting OER through our grant program only and sharing those with the Office of the Registrar so that those courses are then visible for students whenever they're searching. Um, and so that's something I'm, I'm, I reached out to Michelle Reed at UT Arlington. They have a really nice um, way of approaching this, I think, and they were able to create, create a Qualtrics form that's then shared with the library, the registrar, online learning, um, and the bookstore. So that faculty actually report that themselves. 
because I realized with what we're doing at UTSA, it's great, but it's mostly through our grant program. And I know that I'm not getting all of those classes when I'm just sending those off to the registrar. Now, sometimes I will find out about classes that are using OER because they, they get the email about the grants and then they let me know I've been doing this for five years. So that's helpful and then I go ahead and add that into my list. Um, but I would like for faculty to be reporting this themselves because it's, it's going to become unmanageable with the size of our grant program. And then also keeping up with our faculty teaching that class this semester. So getting them to report it is going to be a better way to go about this. Um, one of the things I was kind of, I was trying to think of our, our challenges and, and showcase those, but then also a little bit of things I'm thinking about doing to work around them. I definitely will probably follow the model um, at UT Arlington as far as having faculty report, but what I'm not quite sure how that's going to work is do I want them to report to the bookstore? To do they report that to the bookstore? Do I have, do I get into an email that the bookstore sends out to faculty whenever they're finalizing their course materials and prepping for that um, for fall in the spring? Um, should the provost send it out? I believe at UT Arlington, the provost actually sends an email and asks faculty to report that. Um, and then I thought about maybe separate reporting, um, but this is something I'm going to be working on heavily this spring is making sure that we're capturing all of those classes and not just those through our grant program. So, very fresh on my mind today, I was telling Leah a little bit about this um, before we got started, but because we had our faculty OER workshop yesterday and I had uh, Davis Har David Harris from OpenStax come in to talk to the faculty and we have had three faculty workshops actually this may be our fourth one this is our fourth one this year and it's been a little bit of a challenge getting faculty in because they are so busy I, I will have faculty say I want to come but I'm not on campus that day um, or I'm not, I, I'm teaching at that time. I'm not able to make it. I definitely want to apply for the grants and I would love to hear the information. So kind of a workaround that we've had for this is um, we do video those workshops and then we put them up on our website later and we share them out with faculty so that they can still see what other faculty are doing if they haven't explored OER yet. Um, then they can get some ideas about how other faculty are doing that. I found it really helpful this year, especially um, with helping our faculty presenters for the workshop. I could share those videos with them as examples of things that they could touch on in their presentations, and I think they really appreciated that. Um, and then I, I thought about, you know, actually just before um, this webinar, maybe doing something where we do simulcasting online as well, because that's easier if faculty are off campus or they can be in their offices and they can still, um, you know, participate, um, but just not be there in person. So, um, but that has definitely been an issue is, is getting attendance up. And one of the faculty I chatted with yesterday from anthropology, he was like, I don't know if there's an easy fix for that, because it's just hard with faculty, uh, the timing and their teaching. Um, they have so many roles and uh, getting that in is hard. Um, and I stole this from David Harris at OpenStax because he kept repeating this phrase yesterday um, when he visited campus, focusing on angels and not demons. Um, and I know I'm, I'm on the, the OpenStax distribution list and we have talked about this a little bit on that distribution list as well. I've seen some discussion. Um, one of the big things I've been working on since last summer is sharing um, the success stories of faculty. Initially, we did a video with students and it was more what I don't like about, you know, textbooks right now at UTSA. It was kind of that slant. So you've probably seen other videos like that that follow that, that same kind of model. Um, and what I really liked on the OpenStax distribution list is they were talking more about sharing the success stories of students that have taken classes that use OER. Um, and we haven't gotten to that piece just yet with, with the students, but we are doing this with faculty. So I'll show you on our, on our library website. Um, we have our OER section under services and then faculty services, and then we have 
um, different choices for them there, and then they can see uh, what we have as far as OER when they get to the home page. And on the home page, you can see right now we have um, some of our textbook heroes from last year. So these are individual grant recipients from last year. It has been interesting um, tracking faculty down to get the photos, but I would say it's been very worthwhile. We were able to, um, whenever we sent out emails to um, our faculty about the grants and the workshop this spring, we were able to link out to this as well. So we could say, if you're interested in doing this, you can take a look at what other faculty are doing. And faculty may see another faculty member in their department. Um, they may or may not know that that faculty, was, faculty member was using OER, but if they didn't know, they're going to find out here. And I actually had, there were a couple of faculty um, from 2017 that we haven't taken any of their photos. I haven't had time to get to this, but I realize it's really valuable and very important. Um, and I had a couple of faculty say, why am, I, why am I not featured on the website? I did the work and then I had to explain, it's just a time issue. I have an intern that's helping me collect these stories and we will definitely be adding yours in um, and it will be up. Um, in the next few months. So, um, and then asking them at that time, can I come take your photo too? <laughs> so pinning them down for a photo um, has been a challenge, but it's it's been uh, very worthwhile. And I think we're gonna be able to have uh, all of the success stories here, which is, there's a lot of value in that. I'll show you just a peek at our crowdfunding project. So we worked, I worked with our library development officer to um, basically put the content together for this page. Um, and we also worked with our development office, UTSA development office, to kind of get this going. And there was a lot of work involved with getting all of the content up, and it involved several meetings with Student Government Association. Um, we did this last spring. And you can see that we were able to raise about $1,600. That's, that's actually one and a half individual grants. Um, so we were able to get additional money, which is fantastic. And now a lot of that money, I have to say, we had to reach out to previous donors and I worked with our development officer to, to do that. We were hoping SGA would really share this out, but we ran into struggles with that. Um, the good thing is we've been talking with SGA and we're gonna bring this back this fall. They definitely wanna help with it. They're very much on board, but the timing was just not right. We did this in the spring in um, March and April, and that's when they're shifting uh, officer positions, which is a horrible time. Um, and we, were, we struggled with them sharing the information out on their social media. So that's definitely something that we're gonna bring back we learned a lot from that. We're gonna try it again in the fall. So um, that is all I have for UTSA. I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. Excellent, thank you so much, Deanne. Yeah. Um, next up, we are gonna hear from Carrie Gitz and Ursula Pike are gonna co-present and they are from Austin Community College. So, sorry, we we're trying to get it to share the right screen with you all. <laughs> no problem. Um, so you can hear us clearly? You sound great. Right now we don't have any visual. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and start talking while Carrie does that. Hey, that looks right. <laughs> Um, so ACC has a pretty healthy OER program. Um, it's been rebranded as Z degree or zero textbook cost classes. We have two degrees and there's more that are gonna be developed. We're trying to figure that out. Um, now, we say we have two degrees and we do, but sometimes the offerings are kind of thin. We don't necessarily have tons of sections for every single OER class. Um, we've had 30,000 students since 2016 take an OER class. Uh, just to give you some context, we have about 40,000 students a semester. 
um, and that includes our current semester. Um, we, we like to say that we save students $3 million, um, and that's using like $100 per student per semester, uh, I mean, per class uh, number. Of course, we know that that's not always the case. We were just yesterday meeting with some students and, um, you know, they tell us that they buy access codes on eBay or they just, or they rent the book or they check it out from the library. Um, that $100 number, I'm not, I think that's a little squishy, um, but it gives us a good number to kind of gauge semester by semester how, how many classes we're doing. Um, and Carrie, you wanna talk a little bit about the history? Sure. So since we are in Texas, um, you know, we don't do anything small. So when we talk about the OER degrees that we have, um, we initially started on this journey in 2016 when ACC was a recipient, of, was one of the recipients of the Achieving the Dream OER degree initiative grant. So we went big. And as Ursula said, we are offering two OER degree uh, pathways for the Associate of Arts in General Studies and the Associate of Arts um, and Associate of Science in General Studies. And so what that meant for the grant was um, we went in as a consortium partner with three other institutions, um, Alamo, Alamo Colleges, um, San Jacinto Community College, and El Paso uh, Community College. And so the thought was that we could all work together across the institutions to share in uh, adopting and building these courses with open educational resources. And so since we all went for the general studies pathway and using the, the shared course numbering system, um, and the shared learning outcomes, working across institutions to develop these courses. The focus of the grant was on adoption. Um, there were a couple of courses on those pathways that we did have, that the institutions were responsible for creating um, because there didn't, while OER material existed out there in pieces, there was no um, overall course for it. So for example, Texas government was one of those courses that needed to be created. Um, and so through that partnership, um, you know, it was a lot of individual work uh, at the individual campuses and colleges in terms of adapting and reviewing. We did a, um, reviewing other, co other courses at the other institutions. And as Ursula said, you know, we're on our way now as we're sort of nearing the end of the grant time period um, to fully launch and brand these Z degrees. But along the way, we learned a lot in terms of um, all of the different individuals that were on board. I'm from the library and the head library at the Highland Campus. Ursula is working in instructional initiatives. And so I think it's important for us as an institution as we went through this big um, project is that one of the things I think we all learned is that OER is um, it's most successful when it happens. Um, and I'm gonna borrow this quote from uh, Tanja Connerly at um, um, San Jacinto Community College, I heard her say, OER promotion happens from the front door to the back door, but I really feel like OER work at an institution for it to be successful and sustainable happens from the front door to the back door. So that is the faculty, the librarians, the counselors, the advisors, the bookstore, the um, schedulers, so, um, and staff across the, across the college, including an administrator. So we really learned that in order for us to go big, everyone has to share in a piece of the puzzle um, to make it successful. And so we are kind of working through how do we, where do we go from now that the grant is winding down and how do we keep this degree pathway sustainable? And um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ursula who's gonna share some of the other things that we've sort of, we're bumping along and trying to figure out. Yeah, just two points real quick. Um, when the, the when we had the grant, Lumen Learning hosted, uh, was a repository for the digital materials. Uh, when the grant ended, um, we didn't have that anymore. And so we have, we switched everything to OER Commons, which is good and it's free. Some faculty have loved it and some faculty have had some challenges. So it's, it's an ongoing issue for us. And then, um, the other part was just letting students know about all these classes we had. And so that has just been a lot of um, persistence in going to each department and asking them, do you have any OER classes? Getting it on a spreadsheet, getting it in the schedule so that students can easily search for OER ZTC. And I just wanna add a couple of the um, 
things that we have had success with with uh, coordinating with the bookstore is that the way that faculty indicate what sort of course material they are using, whether it's a publisher or OER, is uh, the Faculty Enlight service, which is a Barnes & Noble service. So we were able to work with them to get a dummy ISBN number so that that uh, populates in the bookstore holdings as a zero textbook ZTC OER class. Um, and then also Ursula mentioned sort of the branding aspect of it. Um, I think one of our focuses now is really to get the student voice in it and to let students know more of what this offers them and um, trying to come up with branding and messaging that speaks to the students because we found that students will be in a class and not even know that they are in an OER ZTC class. They just know they didn't have to purchase a textbook. So um, we have some meetings coming up to look at sustainability and that's kind of where we are, but hopefully our, our numbers will continue to grow. And uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Carrie and Ursula. Um, our next speaker will be Colleen Lyon from the University of Texas at Austin. And just wanted to note, we do have a question in chat for ACC folks, and we'll get to that at our Q&A session at the end. Hey, everybody. Um, this is Colleen. Can you see my slides? They look great. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the work that we're doing at UT Austin, kind of without um, the work that we're doing to try to build momentum, but without any sort of an administrative mandate or um, a budget to go with it. Um, so we have a group that we very creatively named the OER Outreach Group. Um, and this group has been meeting monthly for about a year now. And I do want to call out the people who um, are a part of that group because they've done so much good work. Um, from the libraries, there's Gina Bestone, Sarah Brandt, Carolyn Cunningham, Lydia Fletcher, and Natalie Hill, and myself. Um, from our Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, we have Natalie Steinfeld Childre and Sarah Sweeney. From our math department, we have Professor Amanda Hogger, and then from Texas Digital Library, the wonderful Leah DeForest. Um, so our group um, in the last year or so has done um, two uh, half-day workshops. The, there was one last summer um, that we did primarily for support staff, so librarians, instructional support staff, um, and other people who are working directly with faculty. And then we did uh, another workshop in January of this year that was targeted on um, faculty. We updated our OER LibGuide um, we'd had one, but it needed a, a facelift and, and some additional resources added to it. And then um, we created a document um, that we called Talking About OER, um, and that basically came out of a brainstorming exercise that we did at our um, workshop last summer. And the idea is that it's a document that has a lot of different, almost kind of like elevator pitches that you could give for different um, groups. So if you were working with um, a student group, you might have a different um, elevator pitch than if you were working with a faculty member. Uh, some of the things that we're working on right now, um, we are taking the notes from our January workshop and we're trying to kind of look at them to see if there's themes that are coming out, things that we could potentially um, tackle as topics over the semester and the summer. Um, we're looking into whether we could do our workshop for specific departments and that was something that came out of the January workshop, um, one of the people said that he thought that their department might be interested in doing that. We have actually started working with our student government. Um, it had been kind of hit and miss up until this semester. And um, this semester, one of the groups from the Senate of College Councils um, put forward legislation uh, in support of open educational resources and the library's work trying to increase awareness in that area. We are also um, thinking about doing a survey about OER use and awareness. And our original thought process is that we would do that survey um, for the whole campus, but what we think would be more useful would be to approach individual departments or colleges first, um, and then be able to kind of talk about those um, survey results in the context of that specific group. So as far as lessons learned, um, with apologies to Nike, I would say just do it. Um, our, our group has been far more successful than I really thought um, would be possible in a short period of time. And I think it just took um, getting interested people in the room together to try to figure out what we could do. 
Um, it has been really, really helpful that we have been inclusive in um, the kind of people that we have involved in this planning group and the fact that they're not just from the library and we've had people from an instructional unit on campus. Um, we have a faculty member who's been participating and then we have um, somebody from Texas Digital Library. And those outside perspectives have kind of helped because we get um, stuck in our maybe library tunnel vision and they've helped us um, kind of pull out of that. I think it's also been valuable at these workshops to have um, those other voices represented so the people who are there and participating realize that this is not just a library initiative and that there are other people on campus who are interested in these issues. The hands-on activities at our workshops have been um, really, really valuable. One of the things that people commented on for both workshops was that they um, appreciated that opportunity to kind of dig in. So last summer we had people working on um, looking into different OER repositories and then reporting back out to the group on the pros and cons. Um, and then this past um, January, it was entirely based on discussion. And so everybody who was there and participating was involved in the discussion and um, you know, there wasn't very much in the way of um, just talking. Um, the serving lunch, <laughs> always a very helpful thing. I don't think anybody came just because of the lunch, but um, I think it did help uh, portray the event as more of a, you know, um, an in-depth activity. We're going to be here for three or four hours and, you know, we're going to serve you lunch. And I think that did um, help bring people in. The one thing that we have learned from this last one is to plan for no-shows. At our last um, workshop before the semester started in January, we had six or seven people who canceled um, 48 hours out from the event and um, we had already ordered their, their lunches. And so that caused a little bit of a problem and I think for next time um, when we do something like this we won't have individual orders and we'll have more of a platter type um, idea so that it's easier to pull in um, alternates or people from the waitlist um, than it was the way that we had structured it before. Uh, and with that I will turn it back to Leah. Awesome. Thank you so much Colleen. So next up we're going to hear from Kelly Viznak from the University of Texas at Arlington. We don't have your audio, Kelly. Okay, can you hear there me you now? Go. Yes, sounds good. Great. Hello, everyone. Oh, it's not gonna automatically let me share. Leah, can you pull up slides? You bet. Just give me one minute. Oh, my kid. Thank you. So today um, we have heard a variety of ways focusing on how to educate and advocate for OER. So I thought it, I would take this time to talk about um, this through the lens of administrators and what administrators can think of in the short term and the long term when they're planning. So slide two. Um, UTA Libraries OER efforts are three years old. In hindsight, planning for an OER program requires invested personnel with some time commitment, relationships connecting across the institution, and lots of communication on the successes. Slide three. Um, so uh, if you're just starting out, you might be thinking, who will lead our OER charge? Sometimes it begins at the Dean of Libraries level of engagement. Um, other institutions have been fortunate enough to hire a full-time dedicated open education librarian to focus on open pedagogy instruction, as well as OER education and advocacy. And that is something we've been able to do at UTA. And Michelle Reed is our open education librarian. Shout out to Michelle, I think she's on the call. 
Um, next slide. We have uh, found it real valuable to leverage current relationships in the libraries and across campus at all levels of influence. Um, this has even been mentioned a little bit today, um, and I'll go into a little more detail. Um, I think in addition to also making sure we're including our student services and registration enrollment and bookstore folks, as well as facu faculty affairs and teaching and learning center, um, it's also an opportunity for the dean to advocate with the provost and the college dean and her peer group, as well as for the librarians to build trusted relationships with faculty um, and to continue those um, relationships they've already grown with the many library champions we have out across campus. And then I've found that the um, at the AD level, uh, we tend to kind of work with everyone in the middle and help to bring folks together as well in, in groups. Um, in addition, we found that services, um, the next slide, for the open textbook network to be instrumental um, when beginning our conversations with faculty. This slide shows additional details that were brought about through the membership and our time with the open textbook folks. And then next slide. So communication, sharing out excesses Successes on OER adoption and creation front have been very important to our administration. Uh, data and data visualizations get noticed and can add to existing initiatives on campus that are data focused, such as our student success initiative. Communicating with our campus has enabled us to provide um, education and information at the point of need when administrators are asking. And this has been um, important in a couple pivotal ways for us. Um, as you all know, commercial publishers continue to approach our community members, um, the faculty as well as administration, encouraging them to sign on for inclusive access memberships. Um, and fortunately, we are building a relationship with the libraries as an area of expertise so they will come to us and ask for information. And as a result, our provost um, this last uh, summer encouraged, made such a strong declaration to faculty that any new courses that were created would be exempt from having inclusive access packages. And that was a big success story for us on campus. So I think it's important when you're sharing out successes to look for both short-term and long-term wins that you can talk about. And I love some of the examples that have already been shared here today where you're telling it from the perspective of the student or the perspective of the faculty member. Um, because after all, it's, it's all of us working at the different levels across the campus to enable adoption and adaption and then the creation of OER. Thank you. Feel free to reach out to Michelle or I. Um, we're happy to have more conversations. Oh, thanks so much, Kelly. Um, looks like we're ready to launch into our final speaker today, who is Philip Anaya from Alamo College's district. Loading up. Well, hello, I'm uh, Philip and I, I'm with Alamo Colleges. 
uh, as you can tell, I had a little fun with this uh, little presentation. Um, and I want to give you a little background about our program before I give you a little snap uh, snippet of the true AF. Uh, Alamo Open is our branded initiative at the district, uh, which is our true zero cost program. There is no fees, there is no fees to students, there is no fees to institutions. Um, is an OER program hybrid. It also includes um, institutional funded resources like library databases, which we strongly encourage, as well as institutional partners uh, with big partners such as um, Toyota and Cisco, where we buy into the program with equipment and so forth, and we get free instructional materials on that side. So we want to have a true zero cost program. It also incorporates IM Direct, which is our inclusive access program. Uh, it's a little different than you hear about uh, most programs. It's actually vetted by um, myself, my department of one, um, and all and all courses come in. They have to verify the cost savings before they actually get to go into the program. So it's not a free for all. Uh, let me sell you and get all the sales. I have to make sure there's an actual cost savings to the students. The impact to date so far, we've impacted over 150,000 students, over 6,700 course sections. Um, we're using a weighted average of $55 per adoption for IM Direct, and we have a little hybrid with the OpenStax numbers. The, the original 9856 number uh, has been replaced by the uh, 7937 number to, call, to take into account rentals and, and used book sales. Um, we've closed in at $9.3 million in instructional materials saved. Again, it's hard to get an actual number, and I'm working on that now because the next step in this process is actually getting into our SIS and tagging these courses so we can start pulling, you know, retention success and try and see if students are searching these courses out. Um, the hard part is I, the Alma Open courses, the true zero-cost courses are, as everyone said earlier, they're self-reported. So we're relying on faculty to actually raise their hand and say we're using this program is the hardest part. Um, the IM Direct is, is a, it's a course fee, so we can pull those numbers and get those coded accordingly. Both programs are searchable in our SIS, so we use Banner. We use a drop down under the Attribute and Location menu, and uh, students can search for those as soon as registration is open. And we've had that feature uh, well before the state mandated it, but it's, it's been in place for several semesters and I actually do table events. Um, by the way, happy Open Week. I was actually at one of the colleges yesterday with uh, a couple other faculty members uh, promoting the program and, and just bringing awareness. That's one step that um, everyone needs to focus on is tell your end users where to find them and how to use them. But I want to focus on one thing. It's after you get the commitment, after you make the sale. We're, we're kind of like salesmen trying to push OER and, and support it for the most part. But after you make get that yes from a faculty member, first of all, you got to congratulate yourself, congratulate the faculty. Celebrate the success. That's big. But the big thing is, you, it doesn't stop there. You have to deal with faculty frustration. You might have copyright infringement issues. This is brand new. Everyone's used to like saying, well, if I get a couple of questions from this test bank, a couple of questions from this test bank, I make my own test bank, I'm good to go. And that's a no. <laughs> but the big one is interdepartmental conflict, which I've seen a couple of times in some of our implementations here at the at uh, Alamo Colleges. And I say that because it's it's hard to go against the norm. Uh, these are early adopters we're dealing with, even though this program and initiative has been in place since spring of 15. It's still new. Uh, people don't really know how to truly define it. We go off of, you know, Hewitt Foundation to define OER. We have a hybrid definition ourselves here at, at Alamo. But they're, they're getting it from both sides, um, and I say up and down. They're getting it from poly peers. They're getting it from faculty member uh, chairs, maybe leads, that <clears throat> they're concerned because it's the unknown. You're gonna, you're gonna, students are gonna enroll in your class before my class. The OER may not be rig uh, have enough rigor for for my department, as a chair might say. Um, it, it's hard to to truly define it, but you have to be there for those faculty members and help them find a way around it. It can be detrimental to your program. You could have people quitting, just stop using it and conform to the culture. Um, they can get burned out and tired of it and just like, I'm done. I don't want to deal with this. I was happy before. I just use a textbook anyway. 
Um, so you have to be able to identify and just be there to support those faculty members in whatever way they can. The one thing that I've heard a lot from the other side is the academic freedom, which brings me the true AF. So true academic freedom um, from the American Association of University Professors um, states this briefly. There's several statements from 1915 and 1940, uh, but it entitles the freedom of the classroom to discuss their subject. Okay, there is a great article um, by Carrie Nelson that I can go to later, but I want to jump ahead here. And you may hear that academic rigor. You may hear that it's easier. You know, the 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 OERs you're using aren't aren't up to standard. You're not following SLOs. These courses won't transfer. These are stuff that peers and or chairs or, or leads are using against your your adopters. So the article I mentioned earlier was from, from Kerry. He he breaks down the, the, the 1940 article pretty well into two points in what academic freedom does and what it doesn't do. Uh, back then, the, the our discussion was academic freedom in regards to research and tenure and so forth. But as you can see here, the quote is established the faculty member the right to remain true to his or her pedagogical philosophy and intellectual commitments. It preserves the intellectual integrity of our educational systems and thus serves the public good. So public good can be defined several ways, but we won't get into that discussion. It gives the faculty substantial latitude in deciding how to teach the course. It's their call. I have a, um, a dean at one of the colleges here that has been very supportive, and it's important to have good support that says if you're going to question the OER usage by a peer, you're going to open yourself up to the same um, committee meeting or, or same same ridicule. So, you know, there's one thing that he mentions, uh, Kerry mentions in his article about academic freedom. It doesn't give the right to harass or threaten or intimidate, and it focuses on students. But I would go ahead and add other faculty members as well uh, to that statement because they're free to do what they seem is fit as well in their classroom. I would also add that with the interdepartmental conflict, there might be other frustrations that faculty deal with as well as locating content, which everyone on this call for the most part are librarians and, and they know how to do that. But again, it's asking that question. Faculty don't like to ask questions. They like to know the answers. Having high-level administrative support, that's board, that's the board, president, and deans, which all of us should have uh, for going on this direction, but also the academic support, which is IT, instructional designers, maybe a committee or task force. Uh, it seems to have that peer-to-peer -peer connection and also resources to build if they don't have it in, 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 their, uh, in their resources already. And just remember, this is for students. This is students first. Um, always remember, students are here for us. We're here to help them uh, be successful. And I thank you for your time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Philip. Um, so just to note the time, uh, we are just one minute past four o'clock. We didn't leave any time for Q&A, but you are welcome to stick around for a few minutes to ask questions if you need to. And if our presenters uh, need to go, um, maybe, maybe a couple of you could stick around just to answer some questions if they come up. Um, we definitely want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thanks our presenters, uh, to our presenters for sharing your knowledge and your experiences. Uh, we will be sending out this recording uh, after it's been captioned, uh, and we'll have links to all the slides in the next week or so. We also have our next, uh, see, when's our next webinar is April 9th at 1 p.m., where we are going to bring back some different folks to talk about how to get buy-in on your campus. Uh, we'll also have a survey to share out in an email that will ask you how we did 
and um, also ask you for ideas for our fourth and final webinar in the series. It's audience choice. So we're going to be pulling um, the theme for that webinar from your feedback directly. So does anyone have any questions for the presenters? We have a question here from Angela. Angela asks, I have a question for anyone who can give feedback. What role does the bookstore play in OER adoption slash sustaining OER use on campus? Does one of our presenters want to tackle this? This is Philip from Alamo. Um, we're a Follett campus. Uh, we've been a Follett campus for years. Um, they're coming around. Uh, one of the issues we had uh, early on was that being part of the grant with that uh, Carrie uh, mentioned earlier with Achieving the Dream, uh, Lumen Learning was the main provider of uh, OER content and verification. They had signed a distribution license with Follett that same quarter. And we had had a previous agreement with them uh, directly with, with uh, Lumen because we were early adopters at a ridiculously low rate. Um, They've been pretty receptive. It's limited with Lumen, but moving forward, they've actually created a an adoption tag called OER Materials um, that's already coded in their system. We're trying to get that worded to incorporate Alamo Open Materials, um, so the faculty can submit their their uh, adoptions into the bookstore and have that check. Um, but they've been very supportive. They understand the mix and the balance as well. This is Deanne at UTSA. I can kind of echo um, our experiences with the bookstore here have been very positive at UT San Antonio. We also have a Follett bookstore. Um, I was at a conference last weekend called CAMEX, and it's mainly for bookstore reps. And it was a very it was very interesting presenting on a panel um, to a different audience than I'm accustomed to. Um, and so having that conversation with uh, the bookstore folks about um, their role on campus, that's basically what, what we were chatting about on the panel, and that it's, it was really inspiring. There was a um, panel member, I wish I had gotten his name, I'm gonna reach out to the coordinator to, to, to find that out, but he shared a story, he works at a, a, a UC uh, university, I don't even remember which one. He was kind of a last minute add to the panel, but um, he shared some stories. And, and the main message that he had for the attendees of that conference was, your role is to support student success. In fact, that's what our bookstore told us when we first met with them about OER. We were, were not sure what we would get, if we would get pushback, but they were on board right away. They said, our role is to support student success. Um, if we make a profit, that's great. We don't make a lot of profit off of books. It's more from apparel and other things that we sell here. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the manager of the bookstore from the panel, um, that was his main message to the audience. And that was really exciting to hear that at a, at a bookstore conference, that the main message was, if you go at it from the direction of, I am here to support students, that's the way it sh you should be approaching it. So. Um, I was really inspired by that. And that was a couple of weekends ago here in San Antonio. And it was something that when I attended the Open Ed Conference in Niagara Falls, I was invited to, to speak on that panel. So it was, it was exciting. Thanks, we had a couple of comments. Uh, Michelle Reed says some students still want print. Bookstores are key to providing those optional copies of OER and they're usually responsible for reporting compliance. And then Carrie, uh, one of our presenters says, at Austin Community College, they use Barnes and Noble and they have been helpful. They've actually given a specific ISBN for OER classes and have said they just wanna know what the OER sections are so they can communicate clearly to students. So it sounds like there's some, some ways that the bookstore will work with you. Uh, 406 is my time here. I think we could go another few minutes if anyone had another question. I mean, I'm sure we all have lots of questions. I know I do. Um, oh, and thanks, Deanne, that you share your list of courses with the bookstore so they can share with students. That's at UT San Antonio. 
right, list of OER courses. So it sounds like the uh, there are no more questions in chat that I'm seeing. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions uh, via email and also through our listserv. I guess we will wrap it up now. And again, thank you to everyone for sticking with us and attending this webinar today. We hope to see you on Tuesday, April 9th at 1 p.m. at our next webinar. And many thanks to our presenters. Excellent job. That's it. Have a great day, everyone.